Good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Kelly McBride, and as Paul said, I work for an organisation called the Democratic Society. I'm based in Edinburgh, in Scotland myself, and I've been working in the field of dialogue and deliberation in various guises, some in non-formal education, some in youth work, um, for around 10 years. And I started really seriously using and exploring digital tools about seven years ago. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about digital democracy today. So digital uh, simply is the practice of using digital tools and technologies. And when we're talking about democracy, what I'm talking about really is how we use digital tools to broaden and deepen participation, to provide information, to promote transparency and to enable decision making. So digital, digital can be used in multiple different ways and I'm going to talk about it in probably quite a broad sense today. So what does digital look like? Um, it might surprise you, it might not, to see that not all these pictures are really digital. So the angle that we often take at DEMSOC in the projects that we do is starting from a position of thinking about why, uh, what is the project we want to do and what do we want to achieve and how can digital or the use of technology support or enable those goals that you have. Sometimes it's absolutely appropriate to use digital and it's a great idea to think of the different ways that you can integrate it into your projects. And in other settings, it's maybe not appropriate. Um, but in multiple settings, we tend to use digital uh, alongside processes that are also conducted offline. So digital can be people sitting at home, reading information, generating ideas, participating in something you've set up. It can also be you taking your mobile technology and doing like I was doing in that middle picture, visiting a care home to talk about the ideas that had been generated in the community for how to spend local budgets. It can also be uh, used in events that you have, so people come and they use digital technology to look at the different things that have been suggested by the community and maybe vote, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But it also is the way that you can, for example, generate ideas both online and offline. And all of that stuff that is generated is brought together at a local community event uh, where people then have the opportunity to develop proposals, develop ideas, and maybe also vote. So digital can be used in multiple different ways. Um, and of course, you know, sometimes people will talk about how digital can't completely replace face-to-face. Uh, we see a lot of processes that use digital only, but as I've already uh, emphasised, we use a lot that see digital as one component of a broader process. Um, and it really it is about just finding the best fits. So, some benefits of using digital. Um, there are multiple, but I've just highlighted a few here. So, of course, reaching new audiences. Um, we often, in the work that we do, have that kind of threshold problem, the problem of getting people over the barrier uh, into the physical space, into the room. Sometimes digital can help to involve people in different ways that may not have crossed that threshold yet. Although in my experience, um, if I put, think about a participatory budgeting project where I personally live, I've noticed that people that engage with that process online over about two to three years, actually then in the fourth year went to the physical event themselves. So they kind of build up an understanding of the process and then they engaged in a different way. Um, it can involve more people in decision making. It can overcome barriers of place and time. In feedback, we see where we use digital tools, sometimes we get comments from people who are housebound, for example, who simply wouldn't have been able to engage in the process because they didn't have the time to come to the event. And this has given them a new route to participate. So you can see multiple routes of participation being possible. Harnessing the power of networks as well. Um, of course, uh, some digital processes, um, you may create a specific site but you can also share uh, digital processes quite easily online and filter people to participate um, quite quickly rather than kind of sharing information then they have to come to an event uh, later on. And I mean, just, just a tip, I've, I've found actually uh, in a lot of local processes, reaching out to people that run really popular groups on social media like buy and sell groups and asking for permission to post about processes has actually generated quite a lot of interest. So it's worth just kind of seeing some of the social networks out there and connecting them to whatever it is that you're doing. Um, openness and transparency, uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, mobile and integration, so you can take your tech out with you into the streets. And developing new skills and ways of working, both for using digital in this context, but more widely as we see the proliferation of digital being used for all sorts of things from public services, from connecting with communities uh, and everything really. Um, so some examples here. 
I'm going to talk about a few examples and not do that in any depth or give you any case studies, but just to give you an idea of how it can be used. Um, and I'm presenting it here in a quite a broad sense. I'm not going to touch really on social media and more traditional consultation processes where, for example, a, a local government might put up a consultation, there's a 50-page document you need to read, and then you have to submit a, a really lengthy written response to that as an organised organisation. Um, so I'll briefly touch on each of these in turn. So, crowdsourcing and idea generation. Um, essentially, if you have a question or an issue that you want to solve or you want some input and ideas for how you could go about doing that, crowdsourcing idea generation is a great way to do it. I see this used quite regularly in things like participatory budgeting, um, but I've also seen it in the example we have up here, um, the Welsh Assembly on the future of agriculture in Wales, on environmental projects, on transport, uh, ideas for community projects, uh, language projects, health projects. So basically, crowdsourcing and idea generation is giving a chance for people to say, I have an idea, this is what it is. Uh, it's presented here in quite a basic form, but you can attach all sorts of information, audiovisual media and other things to some of the platforms that exist. Um, and this is just another example as well as something that's happened really recently in Scotland. Uh, the committee engagement unit there um, basically uh, used a tool to inform the local government and communities <laughs> committee on what they should be focusing on uh, for the next period of time. And they had quite a bit of engagement increase uh, by using a digital tool. Another idea is collaborative drafting and proposals. Um, so examples I have up here, uh, one city put up their future plan, um, which I think was 10, maybe 20 year plan, and they got the public to comment on those draft proposals and also suggest edits that could be incorporated. There was also a space to discuss the proposals and other things. Um, some people like to use things like Google Docs as well to kind of get some, some insight, but I'm aware that not everyone likes to use tools like that. But there are some free options out there that you could possibly use if you wanted people to get involved in commenting and improving on different uh, proposals. And another example, um, it's been used in lawmaking uh, for collaborative online lawmaking. Um, there was a good example from Brazil a few years ago, uh, but it has been used for purposes like that too. So deliberation, and I know that's going to be really at the heart of what we're going to be discussing um, over the course of the day, I'm sure. Um, there's a few things to say about online deliberation. I mean, I think the space that a lot of us use when we're talking about issues online, um, social media is obviously very popular, but social media isn't necessarily set up to be a site of healthy debates. There are some organisations uh, that have put a lot of work into thinking about how you could structure online spaces to have conversations, to have debates and to deliberate. I've just put a couple of examples up here and maybe you'll be able to see how different this is from something uh, like a popular social media platform. So in this example on the left, uh, an organisation called Citizens Foundation and Ireland have put a lot of thought into this. So when someone posts an idea, they post a proposal, the way they've set up the, the deliberation, the debate below, um, is that people need to propose ideas for and ideas against. You're not immediately replying to something someone has said. It's not kind of a personal way of responding to a comment, but it's trying to put you in a position of thinking, actually, why do I support this or why do not? Do I not support this? And what argument can I make uh, to try and convince others that are looking at this? So it's a slightly different way of setting it up. Um, this example from Consider It on the right uh, does a similar thing, but it also shows you kind of levels of uh, agreement or disagreement for different ideas too. So I think the key takeaway for this is the way that you set it up matters if you're looking to do deliberation online. And context obviously is also important. It might not be appropriate to set that up in your community, um, or you might want to set it up but ensure that you have moderation and facilitation support to make it work. Um, another thing I will say is it's often good to uh, co-design processes with people that are going to use it. Um, I know, for example, uh, a, a youth group I'm aware of in Scotland recently, they asked young people how they'd like to discuss matters with each other online. And they said, we don't want a new, new tool, we want to use something called Discord, which is a gaming app. Uh, and this was not a gaming youth group at all, but it was a platform that they were already on and familiar with and felt comfortable using to discuss issues. And some of those issues are actually around social justice and others. Um, so participatory budgeting. Um, so digital can be used variously for things like participatory budgeting, which is where communities have a say in deciding how a pot of money is spent, typically at the local level. 
There's loads of examples from across the world. There are so many now. Um, but in Scotland, we were supporting a digital program for participatory budgeting, which was funded by the <laughs> Scottish Government. And I've got a couple of examples quickly here. Um, so this is an example from Dundee. And uh, uh, 112,508 votes were cast in their PB process, which suggested, um, sorry, which suggested that participants also changed their minds and considered their options quite a lot. And you can see that because you can see which ideas were selected and removed throughout that voting process. Um, they also found that this map was explored over 2,000 times, which suggested that participants thought about the locations about different projects when making their decisions. Um, and you'll see this in a lot of PB projects, that people like to set it up in a way that people consider uh, issues in communities that are not necessarily their own, um, and that especially comes across in voting. Projects were explored, um, which means that people were actually reading the substance uh, and reading some of the detail behind these projects, and you could see that from the data that came through. Uh, they had loads of PDFs attached to the projects, so people were certainly reading and skimming the high-level stuff, but then they were digging into more detail, which was really interesting to see, because sometimes an argument against digital is, are oh, people just go on and they like choose whatever, but this demonstrates that's not always the case. And they also did um, a lot of qualitative analysis, which suggested from the participants that they deliberated over their choices and had a desire to think about longer term benefits of their decisions. And if you see this kind of digital stuff play out in uh, offline spaces, it's really interesting to see the debate it actually generates amongst people. Um, and I've seen that having gone into schools and sat there with an iPad and, and had discussions with people, and then they kind of generated discussions on their own. Um, just want to highlight here uh, that digital can also um, show you kind of where ideas are springing up, so you can install things like maps. Um, and voting, of course. I mean, you might be very aware that you can vote online, but you can do it in multiple different ways, um, depending on how you'd like to set up voting methods. It's not entirely rigid. And live participation, we've had a good example of that here today. Uh, we've been using Mentimeter, um, but we've also seen live participation incorporated into things like citizens' assemblies um, and lots and lots of other uh, off, uh, offline spaces too. So you can bring that stuff into the room, make it quite interactive and quite exciting. And also open government. Um, so what this is up here, it's an example from Mexico. Basically, they have an open government national action plan, and they use this website to track the progress of those plans. Um, and there's all sorts of kind of widgets and things that you can install to enable you to do that on the websites you currently have or, or could potentially develop. And open data is a really important part of that. Um, but yes, I mean, the possibilities, there, there are so, so many. Um, I'm not going to go into any of these for detail, uh, but I just wanted to respond because I know a few of you had specific things. Is that, is that for me? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, so in France, for example, they had a big citizen uh, consultation across the country, and they used a digital tool as a way to find out what conversations were happening in local places. They were publishing that information so anyone across the country could see what someone somewhere else was saying. And I think there is so much, and I would say still untested potential, to have networked conversations that are supported and enabled by digital as well. Um, I know there's things around uh, forum theatre um, and other creative methods that could be explored. Are there possibilities for digital interaction there? Could you potentially live stream some of the things that are happening or bring some participation via live stream uh, into the room? Um, circular economy apps, uh, there have been some apps that have been created for that. And digital for storytelling, um, don't forget about things like the potential participatory filmmaking and the way that you can connect, connect that media into some of the kind of apps and platforms and tools that exist to say, for example, this is my idea, we've made a short film about why we think it's important, we'd love you to vote on it or develop a proposal um, that will enable us to take it forward. So there's loads and loads of things to consider, which I'm sure we will talk about over the course of today. Um, but yeah, I think the key takeaway is that digital can absolutely enhance and enable some of the processes that, that, we, that you, you might be doing here today. Um, you don't have to do digital-only processes. It's really possible to integrate digital into processes that involve offline spaces as well. You just need to be quite smart and savvy about how you do it and ensure it all connects. But that's part of a good design process. Um, and hopefully we'll have some great chats about that.